You're listening to Megiddo Radio. Megiddo Radio is a radio ministry of Megiddo Media. For more, visit our website at megiddoradio.com. That's megiddoradio.com. Good evening, everybody. Welcome. This is Paul Flynn with Megiddo Radio for the 5th of August, 2017. Thank you all for tuning in. On today's program, we're joined by a guest uh, who wrote the pamphlet I have in front of me here. It's called The Dog That Does Not Bark. I was really encouraged when I read this pamphlet. Those of you who've been following the program maybe over the last few months know that there's been one or two controversies over doctrine, especially Second John and what that means. Does it pertain to certain groups and um, interfaith dialogues, things like that? I don't necessarily want to get into that today. I want to, in the face of lots of things that come up in the church, unfortunately, I think we can be very discouraged. Sometimes we kind of think we might be the only person who is maybe fighting this battle, or maybe this has not happened in church history before. I think we can learn a lot from men of the past, godly men of the past, who have faced maybe slander, who have faced various different things, and how we can face them. Now, the, the dog that does not bark, um, I remember the title caught my attention straight away. I'm, I haven't actually asked John Murray yet if it was it, probably inspired by uh, the John Calvin quote. But, I mean, it's just sometimes in, in, the, in the fates of opposition, uh, especially with you know, various the- theologians, people we maybe have a massive amount of respect for, various uh, dangers that come up in the church. How do we face it? How do we deal with it? But before we get into the topic at hand and this booklet, the, the subtitle for it, A Heart Cry for Leadership in the Church Today. And, and that's really what I was really so encouraged by reading this. It's a short little booklet, and we'll tell you at the end of the program how you can get a hold of it. Uh, John J. Murray, thank you so much for joining us on the program. Thank you for having me. I am John James Murray, and I was born in Dornoch in Sutherland and converted in my early teens. I became interested in the recovery of Reformed and Puritan teaching in the 1950s. I joined the Banner of Truth Trust in London in 1960 as an assistant editor to the Reverend Ian Murray. After 13 years with the Banner of Truth Trust, I trained for the gospel ministry at Edinburgh University and at the Free Church College, and I served congregations in the Free Church of Scotland, first in Oban and Argyll from 1978 to 1989, and then in Edinburgh, St. Columba Congregation from 1989 to 2002. Since retiring, I've been assisting congregations of the Free Church of Scotland continuing in the Glasgow area where I'm resident. I was moderator of the General Assembly of the Free Church of Scotland continuing in 2003. I've written several books, Behind a Frowning Providence, John E. Marshall, Life and Writings, Catch a Vision, which is a story of the reform recovery in the 1950s, John Knox, a bite-sized biography, and a God-centered vision for church and nation. I'm married, and they they had three children. So uh, thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for that bio. Um, What I was going to say is, uh, just to explain to our listeners, because before we get into, uh, because some people might not be aware of, and I think a lot of well-known Reformed theologians aren't aware of the difference between the, the, uh, the Church of Scotland and the Church of Scotland continuing. Um, I know, not to get into the controversy per se, but um, there is a difference, is there not? Yes, there is a difference. Uh, I explained something like of that in the booklet, in the fact that in the late 80s and early 90s, there was a kind of a movement within the Free Church of Scotland to change things, and we felt that people were they wanting change rather than to hold fast to the Westminster Confession and the purity of worship and things. And so a change came over the church, and there was also a discipline case involved in that which was never really resolved. And as a result, some of us were really forced out of the church in the year 2000 
and we form the Free Church of Scotland continuing, and we continue witnessing in that way to this day. Amen. And I've been really, really blessed over the years, just like listening to various ministers on both sides of the Atlantic, actually. There's some Free Church of Scotland continuing congregations in the United States who are very good as well. I've just, well, basically just listening on sermon audio, and there's a lot of good material. If people go to sermonaudio.com and and Free Church of Scotland continuing, uh, I know that people like, uh, I think it's on Joel Beakey's website, he's got a link to the Free Church of Scotland continuing. And while myself as a Reformed Presbyterian, we, historically we wouldn't exactly see everything eye to eye, but I've been really, really blessed by a lot of the ministers. One of the great things I love about a lot of, especially in Scotland, is when you think of the Free Church of Scotland continuing, you don't think of just one man. You don't think of one main celebrity or anything like that. There are many godly men who are being very influential and um, really, really thankful for that. Now, let's go to the booklet, uh, The Dog That Does Not Bark. Could you just give us a brief introduction? What's it about and why did you write it? Well, I've had a growing concern over the years about the state of our society and nation and the failure of the church to be the light of the world and the salt of the earth. The professing church today is almost as corrupt as a nation. It reflects the world rather than the truth and righteousness of God. And as I was also reflecting that this year is the 500th anniversary of Martin Luther nailing his 95 theses on the door of the castle church in Wittenberg in 1517. And that was a spark that lit the Protestant Reformation, which swept through Germany and many other countries of Europe, coming eventually to Britain and ultimately to America and the world. I thought, what a difference can be made by the intervention of one man at the right time under God. It's amazing when you look back. I think we, we forget the influence of the Reformation. I think in modern-day Christendom we can downplay how great a move of the Holy Spirit that took place in that time. If you read various histories, not not necessarily the modern histories, I think there, there probably are some good ones as well, but especially the old ones written by reformers, you see that across Europe it was only really Spain and Italy that was still in the hands of the papacy. And when we compare, say, 1516, 1517, when uh, Martin Luther nailed the 95 Theses to the door of the church door in Wittenberg. Compare that with, I don't know, maybe a, de- a generation or two later, uh, the papacy was struggling even in Poland, and obviously there was a bit of a reversal there. And the sweet, and we're not talking about sometimes it can be re- represented in a kind of a political sense or anything like that. This was a, a mighty revival, to use that term a mighty revival of people's hearts being changed on a mass scale and God blessing the work of fallible men like Martin Luther, John Calvin, and John Knox and other. Can you just maybe speak a word to that? Because I, I think, do we not, we kind of forget the impact or downplay the impact of the Reformation. Yeah. Can I explain then how it came about that Luther made this stand? Yeah, he sure. He was born in 1483, and he set out to study law. But one day in the summer of 1505, he was caught in a terrific, a terrifying thunderstorm and vowed that he would become a monk. He went into the monastery in Erfurt. Religion was a major element in Germany at the time, and the Roman Catholic Church dominated the scene. The Roman Catholics claimed that the forgiveness of sin could be achieved through good works or be bought with money, The corruption of Rome, the capital city of the church, troubled Martin Luther deeply. Luther tried to make himself right with God through his good works. He prayed more, he fasted for days, he would go to confession for hours, but his spiritual problems only became greater. He hated the holy God who demanded righteousness. In autumn 1515, Luther made a wonderful discovery. In Wittenberg's Black Cloister Monastery, he had what has been described as his tower experience. Reading Romans 1, he suddenly realized from verse 17 that the perfect righteousness God requires of us is given us in Christ. Then I began to understand that the righteousness of God is a gift of God, namely by faith. 
he I felt as I were entirely born again and had entered paradise. The gospel light from Romans 1 overcame the darkness of Rome. Thrilled by his new faith in Christ alone, it was now time to tell the world. On 31st October 1517, Luther made his protest against the sale of indulgences and nailed his 95 theses written in Latin to the church door in Wittenberg. Without his knowledge, they were translated into Latin and from Latin and multiple copies printed and distributed all over Germany. He was declared a heretic. He was summoned to a diet at Worms and asked to recant, but refused. I can do no otherwise. Here I stand. May God help me. And something like that was unbelievable. You know, the fact that it went in modern vernacular viral, you know, if somebody might put something on Twitter or Facebook or something like that, post something and everybody shares it. It was a yeah. bit like that, was it not? And I think we don't, we don't think we don't see it as a big deal, I think, today because we see so many quote unquote things going viral. But back then it was kind of un- unusual. Well, the invention of printing came at the right time for the Glorious Reformation because it was the printing press that spread that word and God used it to make a great recovery in the church. It's amazing how, that, if you look at the history, the hand of providence, how the Lord used, say, in the first few centuries, say, the Greek language, the, the spread of that, how the whole, the whole empire was using that one language at that time to spread the gospel, how the free movement within, say, the Roman Empire, then when you go to the Reformation and you see the various things that God did um, by his providence, uh, the, say, the sacking of Constantinople, um, the falling of that city, and then the Greek manuscripts prior to the Reformation ending up in England, when you study history, you can't help but just the hairs in the back of your neck stand up and just see the providence of God, and it's an amazing thing. And I think, you know, one thing I just, before we get on to the next uh, question I want to deal with, is like, sometimes we can lose hope, sometimes things can look very bleak, but I think, I don't, today is not nearly as bleak as 1516, 1517 in Europe, prior no, to I, Luther. Could you speak a word or two to that? Well, it was a very bleak situation indeed, and uh, when you think of the ignorance that the Bible was shut away from the common people. They had no access to the Bible and to the truths of the Bible, and the Roman hierarchy kept them in that ignorance in their own interests. And we are not like that today. One of the great blessings of the present day is the multiplication of Reformed literature, not only in the United Kingdom, but throughout the whole world. So people don't need to be in ignorance anymore. They have access to such treasures from the past in in literature and so on. Yeah, praise the Lord for groups like Banner of Truth as well, and and even more recently, Reform Heritage books. That there's a there seems to be intellectually at least there's an explosion. It seems as printing. It there's no shortage anymore. It seems of getting Reform literature, but I suppose at the same time we need Reformed piety. That's right. And uh, that's the one thing I would fear is that we can intellectually, we can have all our ducks in a row, so to speak, but the, there is no kind of, we, you know, the, the, the life, you know, Luther, Calvin and other people, the, the prayer life that they had and things like that. Um, reading John Brown of Haddington at the moment, and he, I just, just remember feeling so convicted and, and, you know, seeing my weakness. And sadly, in the modern day, it just seems to be, there is a place for encouragement, but I think we really need to be convicted, especially in the modern day. The next question yeah. I want to look at here is, um, you were talking about a call for leadership in the church. What examples in church history, you know, like, what, how about some good examples? Can you think of some good examples from church history that would be good to look back on? And here is a person who has exemplified something, in, obviously in an imperfect way, that would be good for especially men in um, in church leadership, such as elders? Yeah, I would give you one or two examples. I just think of John Calvin, who was so reluctant to stay in Geneva, but was uh, persuaded to do so, and then he was banished for a time, and yet came back to fight the Lord's battles there and lay the foundation for the Reformed Church of the future. What a debt we owe to him. William Tyndall, 
hounded to death on the continent because he wanted to give the people of England the scripture in their own language, but he persevered until that was completed. John Knox, going through many tribulations and narrow escapes, yet able to carry on the Reformation in Scotland almost single-handed. And then the great C.H. Spurgeon, who fought valiantly and very much alone against the liberalism that was blighting the Baptist Union of his day and also other evangelical churches. And he indeed wore himself to death in a way by his a stand which he took for the truth. And more, more modern, we have J. Gresham Machen, who was described as valiant for truth, contending against the liberalism that was infiltrating the Princeton Seminary and the Presbyterian Church of his day. And he was actually defrocked for his stance, and yet he went on to form the Westminster Theological Seminary, where men like Professor John Murray were, was a, uh, a professor for many years, and also the Orthodox Presbyterian Church of America, which has remained fairly faithful over these years. So these are some examples of men who stood alone and stood for the truth. Uh, let's go through some of them, because I think it, there's some lots of lessons we can learn from their life, especially John Calvin. And it's it's really, really sad that still to this day, that there's a lot of false accusations against Calvin. And, you know, a lot of the things that I don't know if they were, you know, labeled against him when he was alive and things like that. It, it just seems like it comes with the territory. If you stand, if you don't have any opposition, you're probably not standing for the truth. And with Calvin, he... You know, I, I think people forget the monumental work of the Christian Institutes, of the, the, the Institutes of the Christian Religion. It, it's not a complex work. It, it, it's a long work, but it's not like some of the later systematic theologies. It's really setting out the basics of the Christian religion. He's not trying to kind of speculate about anything. He's, he's setting out the very things that really laid the, the groundwork for all the confessions that came later. That was... Basically, what a lot of people saw is the Reformed faith for a very, very long time. And in the face of much opposition, how... I, I we'll take one example, like Spurgeon. Was, wasn't was Spurgeon, he was maligned and mocked a lot, wasn't he, for, for, his, um, for his concerns? Absolutely, yes. As far as John Calvin was concerned, you would say that as a... His translators point out, and those who have written introductions to the Institutes point out that really the Institutes was the outcome of his own piety. You know, he didn't go with a kind of a scholastic presentation of the Reformed faith. It arose out of his piety, and he had that confrontation, as it were, very little said about it, with the living God, which in an instant brought him before the glory and majesty of God. And everything sprang from that. You know, we don't know ourselves until we know God and, you know, how he's framed institutes in that way. And it's therefore an outcome or a, a presentation of true godly piety. And that's what makes it so wonderful. Isn't it amazing that it's always represented, you know, before I read the Institutes, and this is before I was... Calvinistic. Um, I always kind of make a distinction between Calvin, being Calvinistic and being Reformed. But when I when I became a Calvinist, before, prior to it, I just said, I'm, I'm going to read Calvin's Institutes because I just want to know what it says. And I was an Arminian. I was kind of a bit scared of Calvinism. But this was a number of years ago. And I remember reading through it, and I remember thinking of all the accusations that were made against Calvin of being kind of a, a dry scholar, kind of, you know, or that it, I still hear this from uh, those who sometimes would be um, of Reformed Baptist persuasion, that it was very political. But you read, yeah. I read through the Institute, I don't see anything political. There's, there's brief mentions at the end of Book 4, but that's about it. it. It's purely dealing with issues of the day and removing the errors of the most basic truths in the Christian religion. Yeah. He had a great uh, breadth to him, and, uh, you know, I think that's one of the beauties of his institutes that, and also he had this desire to see unity within the Reformed churches, and it said he would have crossed seven seas, was it, 
to see a, a greater unity amongst the Reformed people. So he was a great man. And he was but anyway to come on to Spurgeon. Mm, yeah. I think Spurgeon is a classical example that if you stand for the truth of Scripture, you will meet the opposition and hatred of the world. You are either for Christ or against Him. There's no neutral ground. Ye all that will live godly in Christ Jesus shall suffer persecution. And it says later on in that a section of Second Timothy, the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine. And that's exactly what happened with Spurgeon because of the rise of the evolutionary theory and higher criticism and such things. There came in a man-centered outlook in the Christian church, and the Spurgeon stood against that. And he was blessed for his being persecuted and he enjoyed great blessing. There was such an anointing on his ministry in the midst of the conflict that God greatly used him. And the thing I always think about with regard to C.H. Spurgeon is that often seeming defeat leads to ultimate victory. Hmm. Spurgeon had a worldwide ministry which continues to this very day. And who remembers the men who opposed him in the Baptist Union and so on. Where are they today? What recognition is made of their writings Why, whereas Spurgeon is honored throughout the whole world? Yeah, he went through, was after his death, he went through kind of a, I haven't read the book, unfortunately, uh, The Forgotten Spurgeon, but he, he went through a time where he wasn't really, you say, remembered and things like that. It, he went through maybe a couple of, and it's kind of really, is it since the 1960s that yeah. his writings have had an explosion? Didn't he, Ian Murray write a book? Forgotten Spurgeon? Uh, forgotten Spurgeon. And he said himself, and Ian Murray he brings that out in his volume, that he would be eaten of dogs for the next 50 years, but a future generation would rise up and acknowledge him. Oh, absolutely. And that's ex- what happened with Dr. Lloyd Jones and his ministry and the Reverend Ian Murray and the Banner of Truth Trust. But doesn't it say a lot, you know, if in the face of opposition, in, in truths that have been held for centuries, and if, say, a minister or whoever else is standing on the truth, don't we need to be patient? Sometimes you want vindication for the truth straight away. And often it, it, it doesn't even sometimes happen in our lifetime. Oh, no. That's the difference between our timing and God's timing. God's timing is uh, perhaps takes years, as we see with men in Scripture and also with men in history, we're always ready to want to be vindicated. But God has a greater purpose, and as uh, people used to say before, the mills of God grind slowly, but they grind exceeding small, and he will have greater glory in that outcome than we would perhaps have wished if we wanted it quickly. Yeah, and yeah, yeah. There's, like there's a certain things that are... I don't know if you've been aware. I I don't want to necessarily go into the controversy. I want to keep the focus maybe on um you know how to deal with controversy. But there's been a recent controversy of um interfaith dialogue. I don't know if you've heard anything about that in reform circles. No, not no. much. No, mm. it, it's kind of um various you could say stands and things like that. Um. Not necessarily to go into it here. I don't want to go into that kind of um, a tangent, but um, I the one thing I'm I'm noticing personally is that there seems to be. I don't think it is anything new. It's happened throughout church history, but a kind of a, a danger of you could say, say in the reform circles, we're okay to maybe criticize, um, say the charismatic movement, um, at times, but. I think and we should be careful when we do it, but there seems to be like, I don't know, like the, the rise of somebody like Timothy Keller is an example. Sometimes we're afraid yeah. to, um, quote unquote, shoot our own. Have you noticed anything like that over the years? And not necessarily to bring up names or anything. Like that. I think this is, we all unfortunately suffer from this. <laughs> we don't want to criticize our friends, but isn't there That's a real, right. we need, we need, if we're friends with somebody, we need to go to them and say, brother, I think you've erred. Yeah. Error comes in very subtly. It comes in very often as an angel of light, and therefore it may be in someone who is very outwardly upright and, you know, even 
has a, 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 a spirit of worship and that. I think of some of the divines in the free church, so-called divines, at the end of the 19th century, men who went astray and they brought in higher criticism into the free church. And yet they maintained what was called their devotional spirit and their kind of evangelistic outlook to the end. But at the same time, they were subtly bringing in this this poison into the colleges that they were in and in, into the churches. So you, you can so be easily deceived by a man's outward appearance. And even... I think of a, even their bi- even their biography. How how many books they've written in the past? G.I. Packer comes to mind. Yeah, and you know, like there was a professor Mackay who went out to P- Peru from the Free Church uh, in the early 20th century, and uh, he went out from what was the Free Presbyterian Church, joined the Free Church, and then left the mission in Peru, and he became the principal or uh, something in Princeton Theological Seminary, and he became really the leader of the ecumenical movement. He was one of these men wow. who were so deceptive in that he maintained a uh, witness in a way to his to the former faith, and yet he spread so much that was not right. It comes to mind, you know, the old saying: "It's not how you start; it's how you finish." Um, often people can start really well. I, I, you know, I was mentioning there, G.I. Packer, and has written many, many great books. I think anybody acknowledged that. But you know, with the Evangelicals and Catholics Together agreement back in nineteen it was in nineteen eighty four, and yeah. they saying that they had reached an agreement, and and there's many godly men I know who still quote G.I. Packer. I'll be honest, I don't understand it. But the thing is, like he says, you know, the agreement was we're saved by grace through faith, which leaves yeah. out the very central issue of the Reformation. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone. Alone. And they acknowledge yeah. it was intentional to leave out those solas. And yeah. I, I think we can I don't know. Does it seem like we have become so dependent on certain men to spread whatever we believe is to be important, say like the reformed faith and we could be very encouraged by people like G.I. Packer and various men like that who are very revered and probably, you know, rightly so in a lot of ways because of the great books they put out. But are we probably more reluctant than are we not to um, win if they go wrong to correct yeah. them? Well, the big problem, I think, with regard to the general situation is that we can't reach a lot of these men. You know, if that in the one church has there was in Scotland in the early days, you know, one Reformed church, then you could discipline men and call them to account. But now there's so much freelance work and writing and parachurch organizations that men can almost say anything and get away with it. That's an excellent point. That's an excellent point. That's a problem today. I find that. And, you know, you have these men who are so revered in many circles today and yet there are so many things that are defective with regard yeah. to their, their their work and witness, really. I th- And I think it depends on how you look at the church. I mean, from a Presbyterian... Look, I've come from a Baptist background, and years ago I would have said, oh, look, look at all the various independent groups. I would have seen it as a good thing. Now uh-huh. I don't. <laughs> I don't. <laughs> I see it as a because very... The, in the, the multitude of counselors, there's safety. Really from the church. There's no taking to task at all. Uh, with regard to men, we have men around in Scotland who are denying that the Pope is the Antichrist and saying that uh, uh, they welcome the Pope as a beloved brother and that. And yet no one in the church bothers to take them to or discipline them. And that, and, that, and that's the thing. I mean, uh, OK, Presbyterianism is as good as the men in the position. You know, if there's not godly men and they're, they're not going to bring charges before synod or presbytery or whatever, um, there's, you know, it's it's kind of fairly useful. But are we going to go forward as one church or as several churches that kind of say, mm, I feel this way? And then the, the the unity that seems to be today, especially, I don't want to, I don't want to be banging on about American evangelicalism or anything like that because they've sent out many missionaries around the world and things like that. But at the same time, there's a very independent maverick spirit at the moment that 
I've got, you know, I say a feeling to go to a certain part of the world, therefore I must go. And there's no kind of, well, you know, maybe you're not called there. Maybe you're not ready. Maybe, you know, maybe you may feel called to ministry and maybe you're not. Maybe, you know, you need uh, counsel. And this seem, this idea just seems to be foreign to people that, or church government, that we will, you know, as it talks about in Hebrews 13, 17, because it's so, so important. There's We've raised up leaders in the church yeah. through popular, you know, internet things. And I, I'll be honest, I include, I include what I've been doing myself because, you know, had I done it in reverse, I'd probably have waited a couple of years. But um, <laughs> I just said, okay, I've, I've got this <laughs> program going for a couple of years. I'll keep it going. But there's dangers. What I, troubles me about the American scene is that we have these big stars, as it were, and they have their own kind of conferences, and there's multitudes go to them and great preaching. But can you see that being translated into the churches? Can you see churches that are uh, becoming more reformed and also maybe accepting more the regulated principle of worship and so on? That's what worries me. The new Calvinism in America is great in that it's spreading the, gospel, the, the truth of, of, of the Reformed faith in the five points, but doesn't seem to be going further and taking root in the churches. I, you know, and the thing is, we, you know, people can kind of get enamored with, say, somebody, and I have no problem, you know, if an American preacher comes over here, preaches, and, and a lot of people go, oh, that's fine. But I'm, I, I would always say, are, will you, and if you drive like an hour to go to see some big American preacher, do you drive like 30 minutes to your own church or whatever? Do you go and support the preaching in your own church? Because I think if, if that's not the case, then we're kind of making idols out of mere men. And, me, yeah. and, and these men aren't seeking it. I'm not saying that these men are seeking it at all. They're just serving God. They're going preaching that... But you don't know their personal life. You don't know their family life. And, uh, and I think we've got, there's a lack of accountability, you know, because we can kind of make so much of these big celebrity preachers that then when we go back to our own churches, we're almost, I don't know, some people are like disappointed with their pastors or something, that they're almost wondering, should I leave my church? And I, I get emails. I'm like, no, show me what you believe. Uh, no, that seems fine. That they almost mm. seem to be, looking for, say, the Paul Washers of the world. And a lot of people I'd have a lot of respect for, but yeah. um, they're all gifted in different ways. Mm. Absolutely. Okay, so let's go on to the next question I was going to deal with. So, so we've dealt with some uh, from history, good leadership. C can you think of some maybe biblical examples, more even more important than yeah. ones from church well, history? I think in that area, what you find is that those men who were used of God so mightily in the scriptures. They were men who were cutting the word of God, and they were fighting the representatives of human power and godlessness in the, the church. You think of Moses coming from obscurity in Midian, where he was for 40 years, and then going into the court of Pharaoh and confronting him with the word of God. Then you have Joshua leading the people of God to conquer uh, Jericho and uh, lead the people into the land of Canaan. And men like Gideon and Samson raised up to throw, overthrow the oppressors of the people of God, David fighting Goliath. And particularly, I think of Elijah the Tishbite coming from obscurity. How many of these men came from relative obscurity, but they were heralding the word of God. Remember how Elijah says, before whom I stand, he confronted Ahab with that message. And a nation that was steeped in idolatry and Baal worship had to, be, had to be dealt with. And so the Baal worship had to be cast out and the altar of the Lord had to be repaired. And God answered by fire in Mount Carmel and the prophets of Baal were destroyed. And that's what we are at today. We have so many false prophets and idol worshippers in even the professing church of Christ. And we need to challenge that. And we need a man like Elijah who comes with that word of God, as John Knox did, because it's the only ultimate weapon that is going to defeat the powers of darkness. 
And again, it's nothing new, and I kind of want to point that out. Sometimes we can make. Sometimes I get people maybe email and kind of go, uh, you know, almost like things have never been this bad, but that that's usually not the case. But there seems to be a fear, is it not to? And again, I say we should always, always do this in love. We should always do this to win our brother to the truth. But there's a yeah. fear, is there not, to cr criticize, even lovingly, a major figure because they're afraid that whoever they've been influencing w will start doubting them. Have you ever heard things like that? Uh, start what? Doubting well, them? Well, uh, there's... <laughs> Well, there's, um, you know, to crit, you know, so for example, somebody's evangelizing certain groups, maybe Mormons, uh, Muslims, uh, different groups like that. But to criticize, say, the person involved is then seen as kind of, you know, putting, placing doubt in the Mormon's mind or the Muslim's mind of that which they're saying. That we're, yeah. we're not like, if you look at the example of Paul and Peter in Galatians, Paul wasn't thinking, you know, a lot of people have been positively impacted by Peter. I better not correct him, but that's not what happened in Galatians chapter 2, verse 14. He corrected him in public. And it, yeah. because he's, can we talk about, like, how should we correct people? Because I think there's no middle ground. I don't see a lot of middle ground at the moment. I think we're either, it's kind of a scorched earth policy, <laughs> you mm -hmm. know, if somebody goes well, into error or there's nothing. I find the problem is, that there's a political correctness come into the church itself. I mentioned in the booklet, someone said, how dare you criticize a brother knowing that he is one who has been purchased by the blood of Christ? Well, we know that and we accept that, but that shouldn't prevent us from uh, taking to task a brother who is going into error in some area and therefore misleading others. That's a great danger that a uh, Ordinary folk in the pew could be misled by them. Absolutely, and especially when it's public. I mean, we're not doing, and we shouldn't do it to to destroy these people. We should do it to win them, and it depends on the severity of the error and things like that. And also to warn those lovingly that would be influenced by their teaching. But, yeah. you know, in some ways, there's... um. That kind of, you know, you could say the, the whole discernment, polemics world has unfortunately become a kind of a, a corner market, shall we say? I don't know, you've probably seen this as well. Maybe on the internet, some people have written books, but I think this is something that, to a lesser or greater degree, it depends on a, a man's gifts and skills, should be done by pretty much all ministers, to, you know, d depending on where they feel led. Yeah. Um, to a point that I would hope that, you know, a lot of the websites, including mine, would probably be rendered kind of completely useless in the future because, I don't know, it just sometimes feels like, no, we won't touch that, we won't touch that. But one thing I noticed when I was reading through Calvin a couple of years ago, not that we kind of have a hobby horse, like the charismatic movement or something like that, but that he would take truths and then... Here's the truth, but here's false views, and then one after another. Maybe John Owen would do the same thing and refute it systematically, but that the whole focus of it is not here's a hall of fame of or a hall of shame of people you shouldn't listen to, but yeah. we're lacking that positive th teaching. Yeah, error is be best dealt with by you know true exposition of scripture, exegesis of what the passages and to counteract the error in that way because I don't think ultimately we will convince certain people apart from that approach blessed by the Spirit of God. Absolutely. Okay, well, you talked about the Church of England in your pamphlet, right? Um, what mm -hmm. is your opinion of the Church of England? I've talked about the Church of England, various... I, just before that... Oh, sure, yeah. Speak a little about the urgent need for today. Oh, that'd be great, yeah, yeah. When a people turn away from God and reject his word, they are set on a downward spiral. We see that set before us in Romans chapter 1. Calvin says that a human heart is like a factory producing idols. We do not like to retain God in our knowledge. It's a moral problem, not an intellectual one. We become fools 
and change the truth of God into a lie, worshipping the creature more than the creator. As a consequence, God gives people up to vile affections and particularly to homosexuality, which brought ruin on Sodom and which was rife in the Roman world of Paul's day. There is no consciousness of God and therefore no awareness of sin. There's no fear of God before their eyes. God's rights are set aside and everything centers around human rights. And that's a great critical thing of the present moment in this pressure for gender equality and same-sex marriage. It's all motivated by human rights. And those who oppose the current trend are marginalized and persecuted. You hear again and again someone who's arguing on the television or on the Internet against same-sex marriage, and the person asks them, do you think homosexuality is a sin? And they're putting it on the person as if, well, we are the good people and you're the bad people because you're saying that people who have a homosexual tendency are sinners. And it's just the persecution of the world against the church. Woe unto them that call good evil and evil good. I mean, there's um it's called it's called virtue signaling it's uh you believe this therefore you're a horrible person i'm i'm the opposite view and therefore i'm good and it's amazing that the the left especially even within the church they kind of you know they say they they have a moral relativism very kind of postmodern way of looking at things but when it suits yeah. then they put a moral standard upon things yeah yeah i mean um, and, and the thing is, I think we have to realize, you know, persecution comes not through your nice, you know, people viewing your nice Christian neighbors and people thinking that you're lovely and all this. It, it comes through people thinking, for example, the same sex marriage uh, and, and homosexuality. Anybody who disagrees with that is seen as a bigot, a horrible, a hater, somebody who yeah. despises homosexuals and things like that. So then it becomes very easy for people to hate people and do horrible things. And this is how in, in history we see things. I mean, if you go back to the Jewish Holocaust, there was massive conspiracy theories shared around. The Jews are behind everything that is wrong in Germany, the collapse of the economy. So then it became a lot easier for people to hate these people. And this is how it comes about. And not that we... And not that we should be playing a PR battle or anything like that. This is purely in the hands of the Lord. But we should yeah. see that we should pity them because were it not for the grace of God, we'd be exactly where they are. We'd, we'd be in the bondage of sin and um, we would be w- willing captives of the devil, sadly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. That, that, that's a quite thing. Not to, not, we really pity them the way they, they act, really. Yeah, and, and that's anyway, the way we should be. Raymond. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry. The Church of England has always been broad church. Attempts to bring about a thorough Puritan Reformation within or failed in the reign of Queen Elizabeth I. The Elizabethan settlement was a compromise. She has had evangelical leaders like Charles Simeon and J.C. Ryle, and much of the Reformation truth is preserved in the 39 articles and in the prayer book, etc. But she does not have men like Ryle today. The Anglican leadership is so compromised and misguided. There have been an our bishop, archbishops and bishops with an evangelical background, but when they're exhorted to high office, they seem to go back on their former beliefs. Sadly, the evangelicals in the Church of England capitulated following the highly acclaimed Keel Congress in 1967. As long as they were allowed to be a stream Within the Anglican Church, they were happy to remain in the denomination, and all these kind of ills have come in. Women permitted to hold office in the church up to bishops now, a high proportion of gays in the ranks of the clergy. Same-sex marriage has become a real issue, separating the Church of England from many of the Anglicans, particularly in Africa and so on. And the hierarchy does not really view man as estranged from God by sin, and that the natural man is a children of wrath. They make people, as it were, all the children of God. 
and that colors the whole perspective of the church, I feel. Mm, absolutely. And I just want to quote here from, this is from your uh, booklet. It says, one a- a- Anglican writer has said, the Kiel Conference that you just mentioned there turned out to be a two-headed monster. The intention of the founding fathers of Kiel, that is Jim Packer, Alec Moiter, and others, was to campaign for the Church of England to return to its evangelical roots. But they handed the baton to younger evangelicals, and their aim was much less ambitious, to make sure evangelicalism was an accepted, this is the important part, it was an accepted stream within the Church of England. We should not yeah. be seeking for acceptability, brethren. Yeah. And can you see the same thing happened in the Church of Scotland? Because in the Church of Scotland in the 1970s, there was a large number of evangelicals, and they were led by the Reverend William Still, the brothers James and George Phillips and Eric Alexander. And these men thought they could change the Church of Scotland by quiet infiltration. And although women elders were approved in the 1970s, they did not oppose it. I remember one man who did oppose it was more or less rejected by these leaders. And they said, this is not a hill to die on. But later came the ordination of women ministers. And then, of course, one thing led to another. As soon as you undermine the authority of Scripture, you open the door to every kind of hill. And that's what happened in the Church of Scotland. And there's men who just don't believe anything. They don't believe the infallibility of the Scripture or the virgin birth or the resurrection of Christ. And there's no effort to discipline these men, the evangelicals, work in press press alongside them and don't challenge the, the the error that is there at their very doorstep. There's no there's no wish for confrontation conf- no, confrontational spirit anymore. This is kind of seen as being unloving. And I mean there's no church almost going so rapidly down as the Church of Scotland when you think of the rot was set in by the appointment of Scott Rennie, the minister of Queen's Cross Church Aberdeen as the Kirk's openly gay minister in, the first openly gay minister in 2009. And that same-sex marriage question has been at the General Assembly for six times out of the last 10 years. And the recent one was the most shocking. The church was asked to take stock of its history of discrimination at different levels and in different ways against gay people and to apologize individually and corporately and seek to do better. The assembly took a step closer to allowing their church ministers to carry out same-sex marriages. It's really a appall- Yeah, the, basically the Church of Scotland basically said, we're sorry for preaching against sin. We're sorry for pointing out... Can you imagine saying, we're sorry for the, the men of old, the godly men of old, who have preached against sodomy? Uh, it's just... It's, it's astonishing. I mean... There's a great book, if you want to understand more with the Church of Scotland, there's a great book written by David J. Randall. We just got cut off there. Uh, I'm going to ring him back there. Call the phone again. Hello, John. Hello. Really, really sorry about that. Uh, we had a bit of a problem with our internet here. All right. We can just continue with the interview anyway. So, yeah. where were we? We were, oh, were in the middle of talking about the uh, the Church of Scotland, and I'm just oh, going to... Rec- Sorry? Where did we stop? Well, <laughs> um, well, I remember the last point I was going to make was I'm just going to recommend a book to people who maybe don't understand, especially there's a lot of Americans who listen to this program as well. There's a book called A Sad Departure. It was published by Banner of Truth a couple of years ago. It was written by, uh, was it David J. Randall? I think it was, yeah. and it's a very, he's a minister who came out of the denomination and uh, wrote that book, so people want to understand further kind of an insight, uh, kind of story on what happened on that. So we were dealing with a lot of the Church of Scotland, the, the decline. Uh, I've done some programs actually on, have you ever heard a man by the name of Scott McKenna? Yeah. Uh, unfortunately. Well, I, I spoke about him, but Scott McKenna. Yes, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Yes, no, I didn't speak about him. Yeah, I know he's one of the worst day as far as uh, uh, heresy is concerned. <laughs> and he yeah. doesn't seem to, like, uh, yeah, he seems to be promoting other religions. I think he had an imam 
few months ago from his pulpit. It just seems uh-huh. to be complete interfaith, ecumenism all the yeah. way. But you see, that, that that kind of man is just allowed to carry on. He's not, never questioned or disciplined at all. And that's a weakness with the Church of Scotland. Absolutely, absolutely. So we'll just go on to the next question that we're going to deal with. What other, like, I don't want to be kind of going, okay, are there other denominations? But I suppose in some ways, I guess I always want to put in a bit of a, say, a footnote in here. We're still commanded to go to church. Um, For those out there who are saying, well, that's why I don't go to church. Well, Hebrews 10.25 and Hebrews 13.17 still exist. We're still commanded to go to church, to a church that preaches the gospel, that is a church of Jesus Christ that hasn't apostatized, Lord willing, one that observes the regular principle of worship. But if one is not available to you, you go somewhere um, yeah. for the sake of your souls. Uh, but what other, are there, like recently, it was I think it was on July 5th, there's, you know, this would be a very liberal group. There's a, I can't remember the exact title of it. It's kind of a world... Uh, kind of a union of different, like Wesleyan, Waldensian, re- quote unquote, reformed churches, and I think that's yeah. what when people come to hear the word reformed, they automatically think of the word liberal. Have you ever noticed yeah. that over the over the years? Well, there's a, a denomination called the United Reformed Church, but they were a formation of the Presbyterian Church of England and the Congregational Churches, but uh, there's no Reformed. I think I remember one congregation where there was a Reformed minister or an evangelical minister, but they are certainly just amongst all the big liberal denominations like the Baptist Union and the Methodist. And all these these uh, churches have just gone completely, really. There's only here and there you might find an isolated evangelical congregation in the midst of them yeah. but they've all gone that way and then of course the Episcopal Church in Scotland, it was the first major Christian church in the UK to allow same-sex marriage and that happened at its a synod in a June this year and it allowed a, its clergy now to perform same-sex marriage in the churches So let's let's talk about what is Reformed theology? If I was to yeah. ask you, okay, we've dealt with a lot of negative stuff you could say. What is Reformed theology? What should yeah. you look from for? If you were going to a church, what would you look for? Not to have a checklist or anything like that, but what is yeah. Reformed theology? Well, there's a lot of confusion around today. You have groups calling themselves Reformed who only hold to the five points of Calvinism, and therefore, you can't say that they they're, they're, have the full orb reform system. The Reformed Baptists they go into that category, and they don't have the doctrine of the covenant so much as we have in the Presbyterian Church set up. And the, the covenants are so essential to the understanding of the overall plan and purpose of God that the eternal covenant between the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit from all eternity, I think is the very foundation of our understanding of the doctrine of the Trinity and the outworking of salvation and the glory of God as the grand end of the gospel. We tend to have a man-centered gospel today, whereas the gospel is the gospel of the glory of God. And because man through his fall has a dishonored God and dishonored the Trinity, the Lord Jesus Christ has come in the great work of redemption to restore the glory of God in this creation that has fallen. And that's what he says in his great high priestly prayer, that he has glorified God on the earth, and God is to glorify him, and that will be the ultimate consummation of salvation. Yes, the salvation of man, but far more important, the glory of God. And that's what I feel is so lacking in so much of the so-called Reformed Calvinism, Reformed faith. You see, B.B. Warfield, I think, is the one man who states the very essence of Calvinism and the Reformed faith so succinctly. He says it begins, it centers, and it ends 
with the vision of God in his glory, and it sets itself before all things to render to God his rights in every sphere of life activity. It is a vision of God and his majesty in a word which lies at the foundation of the entire Calvinistic thinking. And if you don't have that, you're on the road uh, to backslide, I think, because Mm. if you accept the Arminianism of many denominations, the semi-Pelagianism, you're opening the door to Pelagianism. And if you open the door to Pelagianism, you're sharing the work of salvation between God and man, and in the end, you lose the gospel. Absolutely. And there's many ways to be Arminian. You can be Arminian in your worship. I mean, our... Uh, Yes. Yeah. And that's why, if the glory of God is central, then it controls not only your theology, but your discipline and your worship. And you meet... Now, when you think of congregations today around Scotland and other parts of the UK, you'll find a man comes breathing in on a Sunday morning... Good morning, folks. How are you all today? And what we have used to have, and still in our own denomination and others, that you must begin with let us begin the public worship of God. Mm. This focus is on God, not on the, the audience in front of you. Yeah, because if, if the primary focus of the church... As, and this is kind of often used, you know, like a hospital for the sick or something like that, or for the broken then it all becomes about, it becomes like therapy or something like that. It becomes theistic kind of therapy where, you know, you're sad. We want to make you feel happy. Now, is there happiness in the Christian religion? Of course there is. There's there's joy and peace that passes all understanding. But that's not the the goal. If, If your goal is to be happy, well, you're not going to be. That's the first thing. But like, if, if it's all about, you know, making people feel comfortable and being respectable in the community. Not that we should seek unnecessary conflicts or anything like that. We should seek uh, peace with all men and where possible. But that yeah. should not be our primary thing. And it's, you know, it's interesting you were talking about earlier about the, this kind of political correctness. I've noticed it coming into, uh, you know, in, in evangelism to, say, Muslims, where yeah. we're, we're so afraid of Islamophobia that if we come with a confrontational message, and I don't mean confrontational as being unloving and unkind and going straight to talking about, you know, Aisha was, I don't know if you know the story about Aisha and Muhammad or something like that, that, you know, you know saying, you know, like digging up some of the horrible things that Muhammad did as the first thing you say. But I'm talking about that you tell them they are sinners that their their so-called prophet is a false prophet, that we try lovingly um, to bring them under conviction by the Spirit of God. and But there's a fear of that, so much so that it's kind of become more, let's sit down and chat, and you hear my view, we hear your view, and I see this in conservative circles as well. There's a political correctness and such a fear of being Islamophobic and being, you know, homophobic, we were talking about homosexuality earlier, or transphobic to talk about, yeah. that I fear that in many quote-unquote conservative circles, in many different places, places that would have been seen as very theolo- orthodox at one point, that they're going in a, yeah. in a wrong direction. Yeah. There's an emphasis today on dialogue, and I think it's seen, we see it here in Scotland, in the arrangement for the preaching in the church, you know, it used to be a high pulpit and the word of God coming down on the people, but now they're getting rid of the pulpits, some of them putting them to the side of the church, or also having a platform on which a man walks about and communicates with the people, and there's a loss of the authority of the word of God. Mm, mm, absolutely. How, uh, you know, just to deal with the last few, we'll wrap up now in a second, uh, but... um. The last question I'm just going to ask you, we'll, we'll wrap up with this one. What is a good balance, would you say, you know, for, say, if somebody's, I don't know, running a radio program or ministers, that right balance, could you say, between polemics and other disciplines in the church? You know, surely it's not always good to be negative. I think sometimes cert- it's very easy to be, 
you get your negative, negative, negative all the time or positive, positive, positive all the time? What's the right balance? <laughs> well, I take the view that uh, if someone is ill and there's a disease in there and there has to be a c- correct diagnosis. So if you look at the church today, you've got to ask first and foremost, what is wrong with the church? And what is wrong with the church is that we're not enjoying the favor of God. God's judgment is upon his people. Some of you can't accept that. I've had men in prominent positions arguing against me that you can never be under the judgment of God as a church or as an individual because God loves us. But that's not true. Look through the Bible and church history and you will see that the church has come under the judgment of God. Even in the Revelation, the seven churches, how critical Christ is in one or two instances of false teaching and false practice within the church. And he's threatening that he will draw the candlestick from them. Now, this is what we are against today. And unless we analyze that our big problem is the lack of the favor of God, and that we need repentance, and that we need re- reformation and revival, will not succeed. When you think of Psalm 44 in the Old Testament, how did the people of God gain their victories? It was because thou art a favor to them. And then they were talking about their current situation, but thou hast cast us off and put us to shame and go us not forth with our armies. And that's what we lack. We may have good apologetics, we may have good evangelistic mm. uh, techniques, but if we don't have the favor of God, we're not going to succeed. That's my real analysis of the situation. Mm. Yeah, it's very hard to put it in, and you could talk for hours and hours and hours and, and still not. You know, there's no silver bullet. We need we need to be broken before God. We, oh, yes. we, need... we need to go on preaching. We need to go on praying. We need to go on reforming. But that is the overall factor, I think, that yeah. is affecting the situation. People in the churches, even in evangelical churches, are not aware that God can be angry with his people. Yeah, and, and the thing is, what scares me is the people who would have you know, been a lot more humble years ago, it seems to me now if, if a certain person is a certain, has been in ministry long enough, they cannot err. There seems to no. be kind of... And I suppose you can, ha- if you look at examples in the Bible, um, Jehoshaphat at the end of his life and things like that, where it seems to be at the end of people's lives that there seems to be less caution. Sometimes it depends. It can. It can be. Yeah. <laughs> sometimes the, the you know the more immature we can be, obviously there's a lot of um, caution can be thrown to the wind there as well. And they, we all can fall into grievous error. Every single one of us. And the thing yeah. about it is, if you're truly born again, you will not continue in that because the Lord will chastise you and you won't enjoy it and there will be fruits of the Spirit. But we should not exalt. The brother in the Lord said this really well to me about a couple of weeks ago. We shouldn't be exalting gifts. You know, people can be great speakers, great writers, great orators, apologists, polemicists, whatever. Um, they can have great gifts. But we shouldn't be placing that about piety, true reform piety, because it's really, really sad when, you know what, I have met people who you just, you just, you just see their love for people. And you know what, you would barely know that they're a great scholar because they don't show it off. They, they can write great books. You find that out later. They just, they Uh sit down with the person at the, you know, the back pew and they'll talk to people for an hour or two and they're not this great academic they're just a simple no. ordinary person i love people like that yeah um but that's that's what that's what you need the pastor you don't need somebody yeah. with a thousand and there's nothing wrong with academia academia has its rightful place in the church there should be skill but true biblical piety i don't mean it in a kind of a pompous way i mean in the way it used to be used a couple of hundred years of holiness uh-huh. where our lives where we where we hate sin and love righteousness. John J. Murray, I've really enjoyed this interview. Thank you so much for coming on the program. Thank you. And the details are in the booklet if you want to. Yeah, uh, I'll, yeah. actually, the booklet, 
Yeah, is it? It's uh, William Murray uh, Dornock. Well, is it, that the publisher? It's really John John Murray at Greenacres Way, Glasgow. Okay, yeah, and it's if you want uh, copies, maybe like uh, the well, email. Uh, uh, we're, we're charging two pound for five copies, four pound for ten copies, and the uh, uh, thing. The uh, wonder, amazing thing is that the 500 copies we printed have all gone, so I'm awaiting another printing of 500 to meet the demand. I'm not usually, I mean, I've, you know, you read booklets all the time, but I was really, really blessed by this. This is really encouraging, especially those who are dealing with, you know, controversies and all this kind of stuff, that uh. there is, be patient. If, if I can give any, if we can give any advice to people during the midst of controversies, Stand on the truth and let God vindicate his truth. We can't kick down the door. We can't do anything else like that. Be patient, stay in prayer, and seek the Lord. This has been Paul Flynn. Thank you all for tuning in. Talk to you again next week.